Good evening. You may have heard a lot of excitement in the media recently about artificial intelligence, this fascinating domain that I've been working in for the last 25 years. And I want to talk about the problems we have when something gets so exciting and achieves so much media interest, it brings with it an expectation, and with that expectation, risk. And when you get this risk, the risk is that people will become disillusioned, and you fall into a period where there is no interest in it anymore. You lose the funding. You lose all the motivation to develop the technology. And that's quite a significant fear of mine, because artificial intelligence has the potential to change the way we work, to change the way we live, to improve society and the world for the better. If used properly, AI can cure cancer, can change the way we use our infrastructure, can make you know, every aspect of our life better. But it's really important that we get it right. And it's really important we don't fall into what we call an artificial intelligence winter. The, con the domain of artificial intelligence, the concepts behind it, first started in the 1950s. And since then, there have been numerous periods of excitement, followed by periods of disillusionment. And the two most significant AI winters were between 1974 and 1980 and then between 1987 and 1993. Even between those periods, we've had times when the disillusionment has crept in and we've had cold spells. So I've spent 25 years working on artificial intelligence, and whilst the AI winter uh, supposedly ended in 1993, I can tell you that it was rather, rather cold out there for quite a few years. Now, <clears throat> we've got to actually, to avoid the AI winter, we've got to look at the history of what's happened how we can learn lessons from that. But we've also got to listen to the future, or look to the future. And I think it's quite important that I should tell you now that like many people in this room, I have actually created sentient intelligence. Believe it or not, I've actually created two sentient intelligent life forms. Now, apparently, I was the minor player in the, in the creation. Somebody else claims she did a bit more work. But I have two children, and actually watching those two children grow and learn is something that is really fascinating for anybody who's interested in the domain. Um, basically, if you're interested in artificial intelligence and you don't have children, my message today is go out, find a partner, procreate. It will change your perspective on AI. My perspective changed when my son Thomas, at the age of four, turned around and we were talking about rescue monkeys. And I was thinking of monkeys that had been abused and were being rehabilitated in the sanctuary. Thomas was seeing superheroes off to rescue hum human beings. Because at that age, he hadn't yet developed the contextual knowledge to be able to differentiate between a rescue helicopter, a rescue dog, and a rescue monkey. If you can have rescue dogs, why wouldn't you have a rescue monkey? Monkeys are better, they're more intelligent. Why wouldn't you have a rescue monkey? And then there's my daughter, who turned to me one day and said, who buyed that? It was obviously who bought it, I bought it bought everything, but who buyed that? She hadn't yet learned. She'd learned all these rules of grammar and language, but she hadn't yet learned that the past tense of buy is bought. And when you look at your children growing up, you realize this is quite a hard problem. And when we look at how the media and the world get so excited about AI, we have to then start thinking about are, we, are our expectations right of what it takes to build an AI system? And so when I look at the timeline, the history of AI, throughout the, the 50, 60, 70 years that we've been looking at this, we've had a whole range of technologies come through. Expert systems, fuzzy logic, Bayesian inferencing, support vector machines, neuro fuzzy architectures. The list is endless. And most recently, you may have heard a lot about an algorithm called deep learning. And every time, we seem to think that the solution to AI is in this specific technology. This latest technology is going to change the way we think. And we're seeing it in the press now. When the reality is that the, technology we, the technologies we develop, they're algorithms. On their own, they don't do anything. We need systems. We need to build complex systems. And we, to do that, we need to change our expectation of what it takes, what's involved in building those systems. Using many of these technologies over the last 25 years, I've delivered multiple solutions, and every time, the feedback we get is usually the same. Can you make it easier to teach? Can you make it quicker? Can, you, can the system learn more quickly? And so I sit there and I think, imagine if I did it. Imagine if I fulfilled my dream.
Imagine if I created artificial intelligence. I managed to discover the algorithms, the processes, the rules, the algorithms un that underpinned intelligence. And I could create in my computer an artificial intelligence that had all the characteristics of a human being, the empathy, all of those things that we need, we expect in humanity. I've been trying to do this for a long time, which is why I brought my prop on. This was my first computer. It's a ZX81 I was given when I was 11 years old. It doesn't actually add anything to today. It was just my only childhood friend. And so I brought it with me today because that's how long I've been trying to solve this problem. But imagine I did it. And then I went to my boss and I said, I've done it. I've cracked the AI problem. But my AI is going to need two to four years of 24-hour care and stimulation. Seven years of primary education, seven years of secondary education, three to four years of university education, five years of post-university, and another 12 years of experience before I can become a hospital consultant. I don't think he'd be very happy. I would love to see the look on the chief financial officer's face when he realizes 35 years to a return on investment. Wonderful stuff. So we need to build complex systems, but we're not going to build it by finding a single algorithm. And one of the characteristics of AI is that we are constantly doing small things, looking for the magic algorithm. It's a bit like, I imagine, you think about all the big engineering projects. You think about the Manhattan program. You think about Apollo. Big, complex engineering. You think about building pyramids. The way you build these big, complex systems, and AI is the biggest and most complex we're ever going to build. The way you build these is with big programs and lots of people doing an awful lot of work. To build a pyramid, you need, it takes 20 to 30 years apparently. You need several thousand people, some of whom may not be volunteers, and you need to actually do an awful lot of engineering. In the world of AI, it feels to me like we're trying to come up with an algorithm for sand that self-organizes into bricks and then self-organizes again into pyramids because we're not prepared to put the investment in to actually build these big complex systems. And don't get me wrong, I like algorithms. This is one of my bookshelves. I'm an algorithm nut. I absolutely love them. I've got books filled with algorithms. I've done patents with algorithms in. I absolutely love, my best friends are algorithms. That my computer. I love this stuff. But solutions are made up of systems, not algorithms. And so I'm now a founding member of Algorithms Anonymous. And I'm trying to attack algorithm addiction around the world. I would like us to actually go out there and start thinking about how we're going to build engineering solutions. And let me give you a real example, because the challenge is that people who've been researching AI are not necessarily the best people to apply AI in the real world. About five or six years ago, I went into a major corporation. We were building a chatbot, a customer assistant. And we went on the ground, and the first thing we did was figure out we need to understand whether this chatbot's working. And the way we did that was to take the research methodology for the experts amongst you. It's called train, test, blind test sets. Don't worry about it if you're not interested in AI. That's just for the YouTube audience. Um, so we actually we, we took this research methodology, and we tried to use it. And you know what? It wasn't actually appropriate. It's a bit like taking a child, putting them in a classroom, in an examination room, and saying, you're not allowed to use a calculator. And then we take them out of that environment, and we put them behind a counter and expect them to use a cash register. Now, the two skills are linked. And I think using mental arithmetic is very important. I'm a big advocate of that. But if we're going to want them to use a cash register, we need to evaluate them using a cash register. The train test blind test method is designed to understand whether you can train an algorithm with a small set of data and apply the results to a big set of data. In the environment we were working in, we didn't need that. Our client just wanted the chatbot to give the right answer. And so we needed to change our method. We needed to change our evaluation technique to understand how we were going to apply this in the real world. And that was about engineering. And engineering for me is about taking very complex problems, breaking them down into smaller problems, coming up with solutions to those smaller problems, and then putting those components back together into a complete engineering, into a complete solution. It's a very different discipline. And we actually need, therefore, to develop a whole new breed of engineers called cognitive systems engineers. I'm inventing the name here tonight. 
cognitive systems engineers who understand the technology, they understand the algorithms, but they actually understand how to break these things down, these problems down, and then use those algorithms, put them back together, cleanse the data, prepare it, abstract the problem, the, the solution into the right components, and deliver a working system. It's a whole new discipline. But to do that, we've got to deal with something called complexity. And complexity is a huge issue in the field of AI, and actually in IT in general because we've been brought up with the belief that complexity is bad, that we don't need complex systems. Building a pyramid is hard because it's complex, but if we made an algorithm to self-build a pyramid, that could be simple and elegant and beautiful. So let's go for the simple, elegant and beautiful. A good example of this was again about, well, longer now, 16 years ago, we were building a computer system that had to read documents. Now, learn, teaching a computer to read is quite important. It's a really important part of AI. And we came up with a system where the users could create rules. And we allowed the users to create large numbers of rules to take into account the difference between buy and bought. That's sort of an example of a rule. And we created this system and allowed the users to do that. And the challenge was that when we actually <coughs> um, came to, to, to use this technology, it's, it's hard to build these large rule systems. It's hard to maintain them. It's complex. So we overcame that. We produced a solution to that particular problem. And the system we developed is now used by 600 organizations around the world. It's used in law enforcement. It's used in defense. It's used in uh, insurance. It's used in medicine. It's used all over the world. And yet on an almost daily basis, when I talk about that system, AI researchers and engineers come to me and say, it won't work. I said, well, it is working. No, 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 it can't work. And the reason it can't work is because of the expert system problem. And the expert system problem said if you write lots of rules, the rules will become hard to maintain, difficult to manage. Therefore, don't do it. That was 1970s, and so no one's attempted it since. Well, it's the equivalent of engineer in engineering, conventional engineering, of saying we can't build a bigger aeroplane because wood's too, too weak and breaks and steel's too heavy and then deciding that there is a fundamental limit on the size of aeroplanes that we're never going to revisit, despite the fact people invent aluminium and, and carbon fibre and other materials. Engineering is continually evolving, and so we need to, to accept that there are new techniques coming through. So we had a rules-based system. And, the and even since then, even though it's working, we have individuals come to us and say, it won't work, you need to use machine learning. I invite them all to join Algorithms Anonymous with me, and we sit down and discuss it. But <clears throat> what we really need to understand is that different techniques work for different problems. There are problems I work on where machine learning, deep learning are, is the right thing to do. But there are other problems where it isn't and where we need to use completely different techniques. Which brings me on to system, the situation of complexity, this issue of complexity. We are brought up as engineers to believe that we should not build complex systems. We are taught in our degree courses that if you build a system with large number of components, they will fail. The chance of failure are high. We are taught that if you use lots of discrete components, the system will be hard to manage and hard to maintain. We are taught that we should build systems with the fewest number of moving parts to improve the reliability. And so if, those, if that's what we should be doing, why do we go out and build nuclear submarines, power stations, aeroplanes? Why do we put space stations up? Why do we build these complex systems? Well, we do it because we can and because people want us to, but we're enabled because we have the methods, the tools, the processes to engineer these complex systems. And we need those tools and processes to engineer complex AI systems. We don't yet have them, nor do we have the cognitive systems engineers to do it. And so, the big message I would like you to take away tonight is that artificial intelligence has a huge potential to change lives, to change humanity, society, the world for better. But we've got to ensure that we take this unique opportunity. It's probably the first time in history that we've had the volume of data, the processing power, and the desire to actually exploit this technology. But if we're to do so, and to avoid another AI winter, we need to ensure that we actually put in place the engineering skills to build these systems. We need to understand that building AI solutions is going to be the most complex, the biggest, the greatest challenge we've ever faced. But it's one that is solvable today. If we put 
the right people in place, if we develop these cognitive systems engineers, give them the tools, give them the methods, give them the skills to actually do the job, and above all, have the ambition to go out, take on this challenge, and realize our AI dreams. Thank you very much.